Good morning. It is Friday, right before 10 o'clock. I want to apologize for canceling class yesterday. Uh, we have some sick people in my house, and I didn't want to take the chance of getting anybody else sick. It's not COVID, so don't worry. Uh, everything will be okay. But this is the lecture that I would have done yesterday, and I want you guys to watch it, and then we're going to have a little quiz on it Thursday. Nothing hard, just enough questions so that I know that you did watch this. And this is all going to be about what happens after the Declaration of Independence happens. The first place that our government starts is not on the federal level, it's actually on the state level. And the task of creating state governments, it's going to start before the Revolutionary War is guaranteed to be won. Now states needed to draft some type of written constitution that defined the power and the structure of the government, and this was because they didn't trust the unwritten constitutions of Britain. Even today, in 2021, Britain doesn't have an explicitly written constitution. The British government works on decades and centuries of different laws and different regulations that work together to form a sort of constitution, but there's no one actual piece of paper you can look at in Britain that says this is the Constitution. That meant that depending on who the king was or the queen or the government, they could interpret the Constitution differently. And the state government here in what will become the United States, they didn't want that. They wanted to make sure that everything was written down and clearly defined. Now, to draft the Constitution, the states all called conventions of their most leading citizens. And, of course, these are all going to be leading citizens that supported the revolution. And they're going to first come up with a form of government. And most of the states are going to come up with a very similar structure, and it's really not going to be that different than what they've already had. There's going to be a very strong legislature, and there's going to be two houses, an upper house and a lower house. There's going to be a weak governor. Uh, this weak governor is usually elected by the legislature, usually elected annually to make them even more weak, and they're not given any powers. There's going to be an independent judiciary. If you remember, there were issues with the king being able to make laws himself, appoint judges himself, etc., etc. So they want to say, let's make the judiciary, let's make the court system independent. And then they want to give more people the right to vote. They want to enfranchise more people. Um, now when they say people, they're talking about white men who own property. Women don't get the right to vote until the 1920 election. Uh, African Americans don't get to vote until after the Civil War. Native Americans don't vote until almost 1960. So when they say let's enfranchise more people, they're referring to white men who own property. There are going to be limits on government authority. In other words, they're going to make a Bill of Rights. So there's going to be freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to a fair trial, the right to you know, protection against searches, and con a requirement for consent before you can be taxed. Now this first system that they have, the first system that they have, there are quite a few problems. Um, first of all, with the executive being so weak, almost nothing gets done. The legislature is slow. You have to get all these people to agree. The legislator need to act. And honestly, all you have to do is look at today's U.S. House, U.S. Senate, and even the Georgia House, Georgia Senate, to realize if you rely just on the legislature, it's going to be a while before anything's done. When they realized how slow the government works, the constitutions were rewritten throughout the 1780s and 1790s. Uh, the governor's power was gradually increased, and they slowly began to develop the system of checks and balances that we use today. Now, even though the executive was made stronger and stronger and stronger. In reality, most of the power still rested in the state legislatures. 
All right, so that was the state governments. What about the big government, the federal government? That's going to be found in the Articles of Confederation. This is the first national government. This is the government that was drafted by the Second Continental Congress in 1777. It created a national government that consisted of one house. That meant it was a unicameral legislature. And each colony had one representative. So there were 13 representatives total in this unicameral legislature. There was absolutely no executive. And the system that they originally came up with, it would have been more similar to the European Union. In other words, each state would have been independent. Each state would have been sovereign. Uh, but they would have worked together like a cooperative group. So Georgia would have been its own separate country, basically. New York would have been its own separate country, but they would have all worked together under this Articles Confederation. Uh, how does that compare to the European Union today? Well, Spain is an independent country. France is an independent country. Germany is an independent country, but they all work together in the EU. The powers that are given to the Articles of Confederation, very, very limited. In fact, um, I have them all listed here, basically. The legislature under the Articles of Confederation, it could settle disputes between states. It could regulate foreign trade and Native American trade. It could set the value of national coins and state coins. That way, that all the trade would be fair. But it had no power to tax, no power to raise money, no power to do any of that on a national level. It had to rely on the states to give it money. And there's no power to enforce its decisions. So, for example, if Virginia said, my money's worth more than North Carolina's money, the Articles of Confederation, the government could say, that's not true, both your money has to be the same. And Virginia says, nope, mine's definitely worth more the Articles of Confederation couldn't solve it. So what was governing under the Articles of Confederation like? Well, it's kind of a disaster. It was put in place in 1777. They can't even be approved until 1780 because Maryland refused to agree. Maryland was upset over the way lands were being distributed and because you needed unanimous consent, Maryland was able to hold up the implementation of this entire government for three years. Once it gets going, uh, foreign relations and foreign trade are done differently by each state. Each state goes their own way and make up their own decision. Each state is going to handle property of loyalist citizens differently. You know, officially in the Treaty of Paris, no more loyalist land could be taken away from those who were loyal to the king. But some states said, yeah, we're going to take your land anyways. A big problem uh, comes when Britain embargoes trade between the states and Britain or its remaining colonies in the West Indies. And this was a time when the United States is just starting and they need to trade with people around them to make money. So the national economy is not doing very well to start with. On top of all this, states start to pursue their own policy regarding uh, Native American tribes. And in the Northwest, meaning Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio, there are several wars that break out that aren't settled until 1795. If I was to point to any actual success that the Articles of Confederation had, it would be regarding the Northwest Territories and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Now, the Northwest Territories, this was not the Pacific Northwest that we think of today. In 1787, the Northwest Territory considered of land that will become Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois. Basically, the area bordered by the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, and the Great Lakes. 
what the Northwest Ordinance is going to do, it prohibits slavery in that territory. So that part of the United States will forever and always be void of slavery. A guaranteed Bill of Rights is written down for that territory. So the right to religion, free press, all that is specifically written down, and the Northwest Territory will have that from the beginning. And it guaranteed that new states will have all the rights and privileges of old states, meaning that Delaware, the very first state, will have the same rights as Puerto Rico if Puerto Rico ever becomes a state. There's no hierarchy. There's no earning your ranks or moving up the chart. As soon as you become a state, you are equal to every other state that has come before you. Another thing the Northwest Ordinance does is it lays out how townships will be created and provides a method of funding education in the region. I don't know if any of you have ever flown over the, the middle of the country, but if you have and you've looked out your plane window, you've probably noticed big squares where it looks like quilts and all the roads are straight, straight and make squares. Those are all townships that were created in the 1780s because of the Northwest Ordinance. And all of those square townships are actually tax districts to help with the funding of schools. Well, in 1786, uh, things are going so bad that representatives from five states are going to meet in Maryland to discuss problems with trade. Now, you have to have, of course, 13 choices, or 13 people. So representatives from five states meet they can't actually do anything because you have to have all 13 representatives before anything is done because everything has to be by unanimous consent. These five people who show up in 1786, they know they can't make any difference. They know that um, you know eight of their fellow members of the legislature have failed to show up, so they dismiss the meeting and they send out letters calling for a new constitutional convention the following year in Philadelphia. And they ask for all states to send delegates. Now the response to this is slow at first, but there's an event called Shays Rebellion that's going to scare the different states into reacting. Uh, Shays Rebellion is going to be based in Massachusetts. Uh, there are low prices for agricultural products. There's a bad economy. It's hard to get credit in the market, and creditors are demanding that any money that's owed to them be paid in hard coin currency. So farmers aren't doing very well in Massachusetts. Uh, many farmers are going to ask the Massachusetts government for help through the issuing of paper money, but the creditors, uh, they're going to fight against that. They're going to say that paper money is not worth what it's written on. So the economic situation in Massachusetts just gets worse and worse and worse. There are heavy taxes, uh, the war debt has to be paid off, and the government is, they're just not really interested in helping people. Well, in 1786, after the state refused to issue paper money, people in three of the western counties of Massachusetts, they revolt. And on January 1787, 1,200 farmers, uh, led by Daniel Shea, who is a Revolutionary War veteran, are going to attack the Springfield Arsenal to try to get the guns. An arsenal is basically a military storehouse where all the weapons were kept. Uh, the Massachusetts militia comes out. A fight occurs. The farmers are going to be defeated easily, but the people are terrified. And by people, I mean the wealthy merchants and the upper-class elite. So before you know it, uh, the rumors of the rebellion by the poor put terror in the hearts of everybody. And February 1787 comes around, and the Confederation Congress meets, saying, you know what, the Articles of Confederation needs to be fixed. It doesn't work. So one of the first questions that has to be asked at this Constitutional Convention is, what are we doing here? Are we going to create something new, or are we going to just fix the Articles of Confederation? And there's two different points of view that are taken. 
Some people say, let's just fix it and make it stronger. Others say, let's do something completely new. But regardless of which direction they take, everybody agrees that the United States needs to be some sort of republic. They look at different forms of republicanism. There's Greek republicanism, but they say, you know, Greek republics were small in size. All the people were similar. Uh, everybody had to sacrifice themselves for the good of the whole, and that probably wouldn't work in a country that is so big and diverse. Then they say, well, what about if we build a republic based on the idea of self-interest? And the thought was, you know, if people want to be successful, they will work to be successful on their own, and as people you know, gain social prestige and economic prestige, if you want to call it that, that will encourage those around them to do it. But the problem with that is we all know that there's somebody who's just not going to be motivated by that. So then they come up with this idea. Why don't we come up with an idea around egalitarian republicanism? They wanted to government that represented all the people and they felt that the elite didn't usually speak out or respond to the needs of the majority. So this would have been widespread participation in political activity, but you can't guarantee that everybody's going to vote or everybody's going to speak up, and you can kind of see that today. So they end up looking at all three of these versions of republicanism, and they take bits and pieces from all three of them to develop something new. So they figure out what they want to do, and they get to work. Now, it's important to know that 12 states, not 13, but only 12 states have sent delegates to the convention. Every state except for Rhode Island is present. Instead of 13 people showing up, we have 55 delegates from these 12 states. Most of them are elites, men of property, men of wealth. There are merchants, planters, lawyers, former government officials. Most of them have education. Over half of the 55 have attended college, which is a sign of prestige. Most of the men were in their middle years. A couple of them were in their 20s. And the oldest one, Ben Franklin, was 81. Ultimately, the bulk of the work is going to be done by about a dozen guys, and James Madison is going to be the leader of that. And to prepare for the meeting, James Madison, he... Uh, read hundreds of books on politics, history, uh, other governments, and he basically he prepared a critique of the government and wanted to show here are all the problems with it and here's how we can correct it. Ultimately, two plans are going to be presented. There's going to be one called the Virginia Plan and one called the New Jersey Plan. The New Jersey Plan basically left the Articles of Confederation as is but gave the federal government a little more power. The New Jersey plan left representation equal among the states, but it did give Congress more power over trade. It did give Congress more power over taxation. Uh, the New Jersey plan was rejected. Uh, many of the many of the delegates that were there say, you know, we came to get rid of the article a confederation, you've basically just left it the same, so I don't think that's going to work. That doesn't mean that the Virginia plan was accepted, though. There were a lot of people that didn't like it either. Um, Virginia plan was most likely drafted by James Madison, but it was pre presented by the governor of Virginia, a guy named Edmund Randolph. And under the Virginia plan, the government would have a bicameral legislature, one house would be elected by popular vote. The upper house would be elected by members of the first house. There would be an executive branch. The executive would be elected by Congress. So, in other words, the people in each state would vote for their House of Representatives members. The House of Representatives as a whole would then elect the Senate. The president would be elected by the two houses of Congress. 
different than today. The judiciary would be separate and it would be a national judiciary that was separate. The votes would be based on population and the votes would be based on popular vote. Smaller states did not want that because it would give really Virginia, Massachusetts, and New York control of everything. So a plan is worked out, a compromise is worked out, and this great compromise is presented by the members of the Connecticut delegation. And the Connecticut compromise, or the great compromise, works out there would be two houses. One house, the lower house, would be based on popular vote and population. The second house, the Senate, would be equal representation, and the members of the Senate would be chosen by the state legislatures. The president would be kind of voted on by the people because the members of the Constitutional Convention didn't completely trust the people. They put a layer in between the people and the presidency. And that layer is known as the Electoral College. So when you vote for president, you don't vote for president directly. You're voting for the people who will then vote for president. As far as slavery goes, um, slavery is mentioned in the Constitution. Slaves are going to be counted as three-fifths of a person. And slavery in the slave trade will be protected for 20 years. So the earliest that slavery can end is 1807. We also end up with a <coughs> guaranteed separation of powers and three branches. There's the executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch. The judicial branch was written to be the weakest, but that doesn't last for very long. And in September 1787, these 55 delegates, they approve the draft of the Constitution. They send it out to the different states, and they decide if nine states approve it, it will go into effect. Now, I want to point out real quick that technically the Constitutional Convention was completely illegal. They had to suspend the rules to allow the meeting to happen since all 13 states weren't there. They had to suspend the rules to allow the Constitutional Convention to approve the Constitution if nine states signed on. So it's just it's an interesting fact for you that the Constitutional Convention that formed the government we have today technically illegal. All right, well, the Constitution goes out, and there are several states who just, they refuse to sign it because, well, number one, they don't want to lose the power of their state, and number two, the Constitution as written did not have a guaranteed Bill of Rights. And the two sides are going to become the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists support the Constitution as written. The Anti-Federalists oppose the new document and want changes. The Federalists tended to come from merchants, bankers, large farmers who wanted a strong central government and they saw a strong central government as the key to growth and prosperity. And the Federalists, they were worried about interstate commerce, they were against paper money and they wanted to protect debtors. Anti-Federalists, they were typically small farmers and frontiersmen. They thought that the state was the best protector of individual rights, and they were afraid that if they weakened the state power, that the federal government would become too powerful and too corrupt. Anti-Federalists, they didn't care about interstate commerce. Uh, they wanted paper money, and they wanted um, you know, protections from their state. Overall, the Federalists are better prepared, the Federalists are better organized, the Federalists are better educated, 
Leaders of the Federalist Movement were James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. Um, leaders of the Anti-Federalist Movement were Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry. Both sides are going to write papers, uh, the Federalist Papers on the Federalist side, the Anti-Federalist Papers on the Anti-Federalist side. And of the two, the Federalist Papers are much better known. The trio of Madison, Hamilton, and Jay published a series of essays in New York between October of 1787 and July of 1788 that are in support of the Federalist Paper. And the Federalist Papers are one of the best ways that today we could see what the original founders of the government meant when they set this whole thing up. States will begin ratifying the Constitution in December 1787, and by June of 1788, nine states ratify it. The states that have not signed on are Virginia, New York, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. Virginia and New York will eventually ratify the Constitution by the end of 1788. The Federalist Papers are one of the main reasons why people in those states turn in favor of the Constitution. North Carolina and Rhode Island, though, they refuse to sign until much later. Now, the big question on this whole system, though, is who's going to participate? Uh, white males, you have to be property holders, you have to pay taxes. Females, uh, no voting rights. Primary function of a woman in 1787 was seen to be a good wife and a good mother. African Americans, even in places where African Americans were free, blacks weren't considered citizens, so they didn't get to vote at all. Um, many of Many of those in black society, they weren't allowed to participate politically, obviously, but economically they had problems also. If you were a Native American, this system had nothing to do with you. You were considered outside the system completely. All right, well, thank you for spending about 30 minutes of your time with me. Um, we'll be back together in the classroom next week. And uh, remember... Listen to this, watch this a time or two, take some notes on your paper. That way, when you come into class on Thursday, you can take the quiz that I give you, and you're ready to go. And as always, any questions, any comments, any problems, send me an email. I'll be sure to answer. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.